Can you hear me well? Yes. I will uh, share my screen. Everyone sees that well? Looks good. Super. Well, thank you. Um, it's really an honor and a privilege and greetings uh, from New York. Um, I have a particular interest and I'll go through that in the subscapularis tendon. And uh, hopefully once we're done with this, we'll all have a better understanding of what we see as a clinician. Um, Bering, is it possible to undo me as the co-host? Uh, because I'm getting- yeah, you're uh, getting all the things, yep, yep. Let me find you here. Uh, there you are. You have, yeah, you're no longer a co-host. Super. Um, these are my uh, uh, disclosures. Uh, they're all available on our uh, Academy website. So greetings from New York. This is my view of a sunrise some time ago. Uh, but um, as we all know, if we use a scope, in this case, a telescope, we can see things uh, more clearly. And I hope to impress upon you uh, that. So this is the inaugural lecture and I'm honored that Hillary uh, asked me to uh, speak to you all. Uh, we do have a long history. This is on Teddy Roosevelt's summer White House porch, and uh, our friendship goes back quite some time, and uh, uh, something we in our family and the Ewan family uh, greatly appreciate. I'll go through uh, these steps uh, with some history, why it's important, some clinical concepts, how to repair, review some principles, and then maybe give some correlative arthroscopy, MRI, uh, case examples. And the images on the right, uh, we'll revisit later uh, when you have uh, a better knowledge. From a historical background, uh, the first report of subscapularis tear was by Smith in the London Medical Gazette. About 100 years ago, uh, later, uh, Codman in the first ever shoulder textbook uh, described this tear. McLaughlin from the New York Orthopedic Hospital at Columbia, where I trained, discussed it related to rotator cuff tears, but also shoulder instability. One interesting side note, if you look at this photo, this is McLaughlin on the left and Charles Neer on the right, who undoubtedly uh, was influenced by McLaughlin. In the early 90s, Christian Gerber really brought it to the fore, uh, the clinical concept and the importance of identifying subscapularis uh, then uh, arose from there first as an open and then an arthroscopic technique. A connection to that, this is J.P. Warner on the left and Christian Gerber on the right, and J.P. Uh, is one of my mentors, and I'll uh, explain further. I had the good fortune of training at Columbia, and uh, another one of my mentors, Lou Biliani, is on this uh, paper, uh, my first foray into the subscapularis. J.P. Warner and I, again, uh, then published uh, our uh, work and uh, in a technique manner on the subscapularis and other single tendon tears. And from there, I've uh, been interested uh, throughout my career in the subscapularis. Here's JP on the left. I thought I'd go through some general basic principles of shoulder arthroscopy to orient you. Uh, this is a right shoulder viewed from above and behind the shoulder. You can see the camera from the very bottom of the view and two cannulas through which instruments are introduced. And this is what it looks like on Tuesday. Sorry for the little bit of uh, blood, uh, but this is my, the camera I'm holding in my hand at the bottom, a cannula on the lateral aspect on the right, and the anterior portal is noted. This is more of a, a lateral view of the same setup uh, here looking at a supraspinatus tear this is what it looked like from the outside. And we'll do more uh, arthroscopic views as we progress. And uh, just to orient you, the subscapularis is here in the front, the biceps supraspinatus, which is the most common tear. Um, and here we have infraspinatus into the teres. Why is it important to repair the subscapularis? So let's lay the, the groundwork here. I'll show you one patient. This is viewing from posterior in the left shoulder. 
uh, some landmarks uh, of the coracoid and the empty or bare lesser tuberosity. This is the coracohumeral interval. This is the conjoined tendon, which includes the short head of the biceps. And what's missing here, uh, again, the conjoined tendon, is there's no subscapularis, as you can see here. This is after the repair in this patient. It's uh, well attached securely. And these are the same areas. So that's what our goal is, an anatomic repair. The video of the same patient, you see the greater tuberosity in the biceps tendon. And we'll go from lateral to medial uh, with the arthroscope, the, the dislocated bicep, and it can dislocate because there's nothing here. The subscapularis is torn and retracted more medially. We then go and try to identify that, place an instrument through a lateral portal, just grab on it. And now we can start to see a couple of important structures, the rolled edge of the subscapularis and this tissue, the confluence that connects the supraspinatus above and out of our view with the subscapularis called the comma tissue. It's originally described as a portion of the superior glenohumeral ligament, but it's even more including a portion of the roof of the, uh, uh, over the biceps. I've now placed the traction suture and I can now pull a little bit more on the subscapularis. And what that reveals is this structure, the middle glenohumeral ligament. In normal circumstances, this is uh, lateral to the glenoid face and I use that as a guide to what needs to be repaired. If I cannot see the middle glenohumeral ligament, I'm more than likely going to repair the subscapularis, as you can see it here under the arrow. And for me, this is level five evidence, uh, but this is a structure that helps me identify uh, tissue as well it needs to be repaired. I am gonna release this as part of the surgery, however. Just another example, this is a right shoulder viewing from posterior, the glenoid on the left, the humeral head on the right. The probe is showing the leading edge of the comma tissue. I hook into the subscapularis, bring it laterally, and here is a diminutive uh, middle glenohumeral ligament. So back to our patient AD. I'm now viewing a little more laterally, and above you is the supraspinatus, right over the humeral head. And what I'd like to see now, you can see the supraspinatus is coming more laterally as I pull the subscapularis more lateral. And that's an essential uh, feature. If we view the same patient now through the lateral portal, anterior is on your left. I'll give some more landmarks here. There's the glenoid and the greater tuberosity, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. If we pull the subscapularis again and view in this location, we're gonna see the tendon is going to come over the lesser tuberosity over here and bring the posterior superior cuff more laterally. That's gonna help me with my uh, repair. So this is before and this is after. So I'm able to get a much more secure repair. And again, the essential feature is that confluence between the subscapularis and the supraspinatus called the comma tissue, as you can see in these drawings. Viewed from the front, if you don't repair the subscapularis and only repair the supraspinatus, it's akin to only closing your zipper halfway. It's more likely to re-tear. However, if you do repair the subscapularis, you do that first, you bring the subscapularis into a good position, you'll also translate the posterior superior cuff more laterally to affect a more secure repair. And it's because of this common tissue. And Steve Burkhart and I published this uh, some years ago in arthroscopy. The clinical approach, early diagnosis is important. This is a patient I saw after an acute subscapularis tear. And this is him, uh, I recommended surgery. This is him uh, nine months later. The tendon retracts, you lose the wavy appearance of the acute, uh, the, of the tear here, you can see it. Because you want to avoid a late diagnosis with an irreparable subscapularis tear. Then you want to mobilize the tendon. This, you can see the coracoid uh, in the upper part of the view and then the subscapularis so that you have good lateral translation of the tendon. Then you want to do a secure repair. And I'll go through that in some steps. This is 
the left shoulder viewed from posterior, the same repair viewed from anterior. And I use a single row repair technique and tie knots. This is another repair, an internal external rotation. You want to stress your repair to make sure it's secure. And then you address associated pathology. This is a supraspinatus and infraspinatus repair that you secure down. Just to give you some perspective of how prominent and prevalent subscapularis tears are, this was uh, some years ago, um, a consecutive series that I collected. And in those 74 patients that I brought to surgery for an arthroscopic posterior superior repair, 31, so 42%, a significant amount had subscapularis pathology. Of these, more than half required repairs in my opinion. The tears can vary from partial tears on the upper row to full thickness tears on the lower row. There's also a significant amount of biceps pathology that I encountered, often related to the subscapularis, but also the posterior superior cuff. Of the six ruptured and four dislocated uh, biceps tendons, all were associated with subscapularis tears in this small series. And many more required uh, treatment, the majority. So if you look at this, and this is a series that was brought to surgery, not just all comers, um, two thirds required some subscapularis or biceps treatment um, due to the pathology. So let's talk about the biceps. It's not the focus of this talk, but you can't talk about the subscapularis without referring to the biceps. This is what it looks like in a right shoulder of a dislocated biceps. It's from the superior glenar tubercle out of the view. It projects almost vertically and here you can see the frayed, fibrillated portion of the biceps as it rubs in and out of the groove. This is a sublux biceps. This is a right shoulder viewed from posterior portal. You can see the edge of the left tuberosity with the yellow arrow. The biceps groove is pointed out and the flattened, widened biceps tendon that's wearing on the bone. This is that same patient a little more medially and it can do this, it can sublux because there's no subscapularis tendon more immediately. You do have to take care of the biceps and treat it and figure out what you're gonna do early um, and then move on to the subscapularis. There are times where I'll do a tenotomy or a tenodesis depending upon the patient and the preoperative discussion. So once you've addressed all the pathology, a controlled rehabilitation is important. Um, all of those are on my uh, website for any further interest. Um, in the uh, clinic, a detailed history can often suggest subscapularis tear with trauma, forced external rotation. It's more common in males. A directed physical exam, as in this patient, has increased external rotation on the right shoulder. Weak uh, internal rotation uh, with the belly press, so the left is the normal, the right is the abnormal, and the elbow cannot stay out to the side. There's also the lift off. This is the normal, so the hand is in the small of the back, and they can lift it off, and here the patient can't. There's a modified lift off where you hold it off, and if they don't have a competent subscapularis, it slaps against the middle of the back. Of course, you'll have to look for the biceps and posterior superior cuff pathology during this exam. X-rays are not as helpful. You can occasionally see a coracoid non-union or a cyst adjacent to the less tuberosity. But the most important thing is the uh, MRI or CT. Here you can see the uh, axial cuts, which is the uh, more common uh, view that shows this well. Uh, other patients, with biceps and subscap, including a less tuberosity cyst. For me as a clinician planning surgery, there's a lot of value of the MRI and I'll go over that. This is a one particular patient. Another, you can see on the left, the wavy nature of a more acute tear. On the right, the uh, completely detached subscapularis, the dislocated biceps and the middle glenohumeral ligament I'm, uh, right here. Sagittal views are also helpful, particularly in the anterosuperior tears, as in this case. But I find the coronal view is actually very interesting and helps me understand the tear pattern a little better. Just want to review what a normal subscapularis 
uh, looks like. You can see on these axial and coronal cuts, the muscle abuts the medial aspect of the coracoid. And that's normal to see. So back to our patient, you can see the uh, supraspinatus uh, tear. I also look at the quality of the muscle, which is uh, certainly decent in this case. I want to look at the tendon stump, which has been reported uh, 15 millimeters or more is ideal for a secure repair. But if we look a couple of cuts and more anteriorly, we see some other interesting features. To me, if the subscapularis is torn or retracted medially, there's going to be a void. And that's shown here under the arrow, medial to the coracoid. So for me, that's I just refer to as a medial coracoid sign because we know that should abut uh, quite closely. Again, this is level five evidence, but it helps me uh, appreciate the tear pattern better. We also see the vertically dislocated biceps. And I believe this is the comma tissue, which is if we followed it would uh, lead you to the supraspinatus tear. Some other interesting features that I need to know when I'm planning surgery, is there a footprint cyst? Not only is it important from a clinical standpoint, but where am I gonna put my anchors? I don't wanna place it uh, in this location. I'm gonna to have to figure out where to go around it to get a secure repair. You can also see the biceps tendon in this uh, patient on the left is perched. On the right is also uh, perched to dislocated. And another interesting feature, which uh, Hillary Humans and I uh, looked up and submitted to uh, SSR is what we've called the Oz subscapulari. We've not seen it published. But here's an ossicle, as you can see, along the uh, anterior aspect of the humeral head. Here it is on MRI. And in all our entire series, a small case series, all of these were associated with subscapularis tears. This is what it looks like in the patient. And then you can repair it down. You can actually get bone to bone healing uh, in a secure fashion in an anatomic manner. There are many classification systems. Um, I don't refer to them as much. Uh, there's some that mix arthroscopy and MRI, some that are just arthroscopy, um, but they are out there for your reference and they're also in the uh, article that uh, you all received. Hidden lesions are important to identify. And I'll go through what this is uh, referring to. And I believe Gilles Walsh pointed this out some years ago. You're looking here at the biceps tendon into the groove to your left would be the subscapularis. You can see a little fraying under the biceps, which we would typically leave alone. But as you go down into the groove, anterior to the biceps tendon, you're gonna see a small defect. This is the so-called hidden lesion. This is a very small one, but I can't imagine it's gonna get uh, smaller. It's only gonna get larger. Here's another case where a seemingly innocent split in the subscapularis, but if you internally rotate and then look through that split, more laterally, you're gonna see the biceps tendon. This requires a, a treatment as well. Here's another case, excuse me. You can see the subscapularis, the biceps tendon, and as we retract it more laterally, you can see where under the biceps, but then you see the exposed footprint of less tuberosity. On the MRI of that patient in the coronal view, there's not much that would lead me to uh, uh, think about this. However, if I go from medial to lateral in the sagittal views, following the biceps, maybe here you can see the exposed less tuberosity footprint. I also have the advantage of being able to palpate the patients to identify where uh, they have their tenderness, to know where to look. And here we are, the biceps adjacent to the subscapularis, and this certainly could suggest that deep surface uh, tearing. And again, this is that same patient, and this is the feature that we don't want to miss at arthroscopy. So you got to look down the biceps groove to identify that. So in the OR, there are different repair approaches. When I first started out, it was all open, and now it's all arthroscopy. Here you can see an anchor being inserted. The suture is 
available in the lateral aspect with less tuberosity. I'll show you uh, some short videos on passing the suture and then here a secure repair. So there's nothing wrong with an open procedure. Uh, this is my last open case in 2008. Um, and the patient did quite well, so it can still be a very good option. I do think you can see more and actually do more with arthroscopy. This is uh, some years ago, a setup that I typically use. It hasn't changed much. That allows me as the surgeon, my a PA assistant and a surgical tech. Here it is viewed from another angle. So I can see the camera and work around the right shoulder. This is... Um, uh, a month or two ago, so nothing's changed except more modern technology and, of course, the COVID mask. So I'm going to go through this one patient in a stepwise approach. This is uh, his uh, MRI, so you can appreciate he's got a subscapularis tear as well as a posterior superior cuff tear. This is a right shoulder viewed from posterior. And as we retract, here's the comma tissue. You've seen this uh, video once before. I'm bringing the tendon laterally. This is how much I'm gonna have to repair it onto less tuberosity. So this helps me understand what my goals are. And again, there's the middle glenohumeral ligament. You wanna be able to expose and visualize the less tuberosity, which is in the lower part of the screen here. Sometimes it's not as easily visible, but it is fully uh, exposed. There's, this is a complete 100% uh, tear. So if you can't see it well, if you simply flex the arm, you can expose it much better. You've got to uh, remove the tissue in the rotator interval so you can work on both sides of the subscapularis. Here, one landmark is to look for the coracoid tip, which we'll be able to see right over here. And this is a wand that helps ablate uh, soft tissue. Then we wanna make sure we have a plane. This is posterior to the subscapularis. We'll go out into the subacromial space and then go anterior to the subscapularis to create a working space around the tendon. This is another patient where you can see the space anterior to the subscapularis. This is from doing from lateral and this is viewing from posterior, and there are all enough space here to work past sutures and tie knots. So again, this is the area that I'm looking for. Here's the coracoid tip and the coracochromial ligament. Sometimes you can identify the axillary nerve. You know, you know it's there, don't go looking for it. This is the coracoid. We're looking more medially and inferiorly over the subscapularis. I'll need to approach the tendon and uh, create a cannula. So I'll place that. And then I want to put in my traction suture. This is a device that can penetrate through. It's about two to three millimeters in size. So it's a small hole. Then I'll feed through a monofilament suture, make a small stab incision laterally, and bring this out through that stab incision so that I can control the tendon. Here's what it looks like exterior in this right shoulder. Uh, the head is more medially, and those are two uh, cannulas. This is that same patient now in viewing through the lateral uh, portal. The anterior labrum, humeral head, and subscapularis are identified. And then you want to release the uh, tissue to the base of the coracoid, which you can almost see. This helps control bleeding as well as remove soft tissue. Again, at the top part of the view is the coracoid, which I'm underneath. And in this case, it was fairly straightforward to release the subscapularis. Sometimes it's not as easy as in this case. There's more scar tissue that you've got to release. Using this device helps control bleeding at the same time. But the goal here is to make sure it's free and mobile. You can see under the coracoid there. And then we release around it so it is uh, in a good position to be repaired. This is our uh, same patient with a complete release. If you look into the depth, you can see uh, the vessels uh, beating. 
but then you want to check around the subscapularis, anteriorly, supine, and posteriorly for a good release. And then check your mobility. And again, pull on the traction suture, make sure the tendon is fully mobile. Now again, viewing from the posterior portal, you have to prepare the bone upon which you're gonna lay the tendon of the subscapularis. So you wanna denude the soft tissue. I've done most of it here. I'm just cleaning it up to have a healthy bed for the tendon to lay on and heal too. I'm gonna to have to place anchors. You can use other techniques like tunnels, but in this case, I'll demonstrate a single row anchor technique, one more inferior, one more superior on the lateral aspect. You can also come from more lateral. The wand is in the biceps groove. I'm releasing scar tissue here to expose the infra aspect of less tuberosity. And I'll insert anchors. There's a spinal needle showing the approach. And if you actually rotate the arm slightly, you can place it uh, in a good position. Here's the anchor sheath. The anchor is in here. And there's that same uh, view so you can see this coming through the skin but you can also go through the cannula as i'm showing here you can see the cannula here you impact the hole in this case to place a peak akin to a plastic anchor and there are the sutures where you need them now i got to pass the suture this um, is one of those uh, subscapular the tendon evulses on an angle on this angle so you want to pass your sutures around in this fashion. So that's why I use this type of a device, which allows me to do that. Oops, hold on a second, let me go back to this. So I'm coming in through the anterior portal, again, in the right shoulder, viewing from posterior. I'm about two centimeters down and a centimeter and a half medial. And I'm passing this monofilament suture, which I'll then use to shuttle one of the repair sutures from the anchor. I'll do this for all the sutures in the anchor and space them out from inferior to superior. Let me go to the next one. And then I'll tie through the cannula with an arthroscopic knot tying device. I've internally rotated the arm and this allows me to bring the tendon directly up to the anchor. And this is after I've placed both anchors passed all the sutures and tied them and here it is in a good secure position i'll externally rotate it and stress the repair make sure it's secure now i know my limits for my rehab to begin with and if you remember this is that same patient so i believe i brought this tissue where we need it to be here he is at six months postoperatively still weak but with good motion i ended up doing his other shoulder which had the a similar tear there are partial tears that are fairly easy, but sometimes you don't identify them. This looks seemingly normal on a left shoulder viewed from posterior, but if you internally rotate it, you're gonna see this significant partial tear. It's thin. So for me, this is one I'm gonna to wanna to repair. Remember, I'll use a similar device in this angle to pass through. I don't wanna pass it in any other angle to get a nice secure repair for this patient. This is a full thickness tear repair, about 25% tear. In a uh, left shoulder, you can see the humeral head below, the anterior labrum just on the right. So I'm gonna wanna expose the bone and then repair the tendon down to it. I've already inserted the anchor. I'm now gonna shuttle uh, my suture through the tendon Then I'm going to use, do one suture at a time, and I'm going to tie them to bring the uh, tendon back where I want it. To a slightly larger tear, I have the MRI on this patient. You can see the detachment of the subscapularis. What I look for, more fluid medially. Here's the biceps involved. Here you can see it, uh, the posterior viewing in the right shoulder and the anterior cannula. I only need one cannula for this particular repair. And you can see the biceps is perched on the edge of less tuberosity. 
And as I go around, I can see the fully exposed bus tuberosity to this, but it's a, about 50% tear. You could argue it's a little bit more, but for me, it requires one anchor that's triple loaded. I passed all three sutures through in the technique that I described to you. The lateral sutures I also passed through. But now if I'm working with one cannula, I've got to remove the sutures so that I can have just one at a time in my cannula. So I use another suture for that. And I bring the sutures out the cannula or back in the shoulder and then out of the cannula and up through a puncture in the skin. Here we have it. And then I'll tie each suture one at a time with the arm in internal rotation. This is the first getting started. And here I have my completed repair in neutral and external rotation. This is viewing from the anterior portal. You can see the knots in place. And here he is at seven months with a good outcome. You can have adverse events. Um, we had this discussion with uh, every patient for surgery. Retears in my hands, I, I've seen very few, but this is a patient four years later reaching for a softball. The anchor pulled out, I just removed it. I've not uh, had a neurologic injury, been very fortunate, but I know where the nerves are and you have to always uh, respect them. Uh, infections can happen. Um, stiffness is uh, not uncommon after any type of uh, rotator cuff repair to some degree, but typically the one thing I tell patients is uh, a strength deficit. The longer the tendon is torn, the less likely they're gonna get back their strength. And uh, I never promise 100% return. So some principles to, as a reminder for what we went over. There are diagnostic findings that I look for. The MRI we went over and I'll show one, one or two more examples. Here is the comma tissue. When you expose the sub rolled edge of the subscapularis, you see it. And as you retract it more laterally, here's the middle glenohumeral ligament. I do a single row repair. This is an older repair with two metal anchors. So I can show you these in the lateral aspect of the less tuberosity, one more superiorly, one more inferiorly, but that's about the location of them. I use a retrograde suture passing and shuttling technique. There are other techniques, including anterograde that you can use to get a secure repair. Once you're done, you want to assess, you want to address any associated pathology. This is a supraspinatus into the infraspinatus, about a medium sized tear, a medial anchor. The sutures have been passed in the same fashion, brought to a lateral anchor for a completed repair. And then the controlled rehabilitation. These do, these do take time. Um, uh, I'll tell patients, uh, you know, four to six months, if it's a 100% full thickness complete tear, definitely at least six months. And my protocols are available, as I noted. So let's, let me give you a case example. In this patient AS, these are my x-ray views that I get on patients, an AP and an outlet, and then a axillary and a Zenka view. Here are the uh, coronal cuts. We've discussed some of the interesting findings. You see the fluid around the biceps. You can even see the common tissue, the subscapularis is medially. These are the um, sagittal cuts. We can see the biceps draped over the less tuberosity and then the less tuberosity is bare and the uh, confirmatory uh, axillary images. So the biceps is uh, uh, dislocated or subluxed depending upon the view. And this is what we see in our patient. This is uh, again, uh, viewed from posterior Here you have in this right shoulder, the comma tissue, a hook, the subscapularis is now coming into view. And if we retract it a little bit further, now we see the middle glenohumeral ligament right here. Viewed more laterally, same patient. But here's the biceps. You can see it here, actually subluxed. I'll go along, portion the biceps groove, portion on less tuberosity, but there's no subscapularis tendon more medially. Just wanted to have it uh, uh, as part of the talk. This is uh, an article uh, which would describe some of the things I've uh, mentioned. And this is what I went through. So I'm gonna go back to these images on the right. I think now that we've gone through all this material, you might be able to tell me what the MRI in this patient will show. So uh, clinically through arthroscopy, 
biceps tendon is dislocated. Here's the subscapularis and the humeral head. You can see the anterior labrum. We can even see the comma tissue here, which is more readily apparent with the biceps retracted out of the way in this uh, view. So the MRI, we know what it's gonna look like. Uh, this is, the, by the way, the lateral edge of the uh, subscapularis. Here we've got a, a vertical biceps tendon. Here is a posterior superior cuff tear in this particular patient. You can see the biceps already uh, going in a more medial position. Here it is with the tear of the subscapularis. So it's a, this is a dislocated biceps. But here on the uh, uh, sagittal cuts, you can see the bare less tuberosity. And to me, this looks like what is the comma tissue that we saw. As we go more medially, it becomes more confluent with the subscapularis. So again, in the same patient, if we uh, retract the biceps out of the way, right shoulder viewed from posterior, we can see the comma tissue up to 12 o'clock, the subscapularis going towards eight o'clock as we would have expected from the MRI. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you. I guess we have time for uh, uh, questions uh, from this point forward. I guess I will stop uh, sharing. Okay. Well, at the very least, I think there's a lot of information um, that is coming out about subscapularis uh, over the past 20 to 30 years. Um, uh, it's really come to the fore. So I know that uh, as radiologists, you're looking for this, but it's quite common, much more than you would have thought if you were a shoulder surgeon in the 70s and 80s. Okay, thank you. I have a question. All right. So uh, you said in that series you did of, I think, 74 um, posterior uh, rotator cuff repairs that 42% sure. uh, were torn. And that was a combination of uh, partial and full thickness tears. Um, but only a uh, percentage of those warranted repair. How do you decide uh, at arthroscopy what uh, requires repair and what doesn't? So um, again, if the medial glenohumeral humor ligament is retracted and I can bring it laterally and then see it, that's one indication to me. If the tear is very small and I showed some of those pictures and I can just debride them, I do, if, particularly if the biceps has no compromise. Um, and that's the general gist. If on clinical exam, there's no subscapularis findings, um, they have a normal belly press, I can correlate that. I have a distinct advantage. I can see the patient, touch the patient, examine the patient. Whereas in your hands, you're just looking at the images um, and you have a far greater knowledge of that. But I get to put you know, my limited imaging um, knowledge and correlate that with the uh, clinical exam. So I can make that decision uh, preoperatively. Um, just like with uh, partial tears of the supraspinatus, if they're just a few millimeters, you debride it and as long as the biceps is not compromised. Um, those you can leave, uh, leave alone. Uh, since that time, it's usually in each, in a one year period, when I look at my cases, um, it's about uh, 30 to 40% have subscapularis pathology um, and somewhere between 45 and 50% have uh, biceps pathology in my arthroscopic uh, posterior superior cuff tears. And um, not in a COVID year, uh, but I can have over 150 cases and that has uh, been a pretty good uh, number for me to anticipate in my patients. Okay, I have uh, additional questions. I don't want to be an askaholic, but I don't see any uh, other questions in the chat um, unless bearing. Uh, do you have other questions? Um, I'll, I'll just plow ahead. Um, you said that by repairing the subscapularis, you, uh, 
you laterally retract the posterior super cuff via the comma tissue and it, it makes for uh, an easier and, and better repair. Um, um, are there surgeons who don't routinely, um, are there, hi, are there surgeons who um, don't routinely repair the subscapularis? Um, I'd like to think there aren't, but uh, I do know that uh, it is uh, more technically challenging to do this. And in fact, when I see a massive rotator cuff tear of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, when I see a subscapularis tear, I'm actually a little bit more heartened because now I know if I can get the subscapularis, it's going to make my massive repair easier. So I know it's going to take me 30 to 45 minutes longer for the case. Um, but for me, I look, I, I'm happy to see that because uh, I know it's going to make uh, the tear a little bit easier. I, I won't say I'm happy to see it, but if I do, I know it can be uh, useful for me. Um, I, yeah, I would suspect that there are some surgeons who uh, don't or have different indications, you know, to do a subscapularis repair. This is not, um, you know, fully codified. So there is some uh, expert opinion on when to proceed and when not to. For me, my first arthroscopic subscap repair was in 2001. So I've been doing it for quite some time. So uh, for me, it's fairly easy. And I do have a good background and knowledge of the tendon um, and how to repair it. What if you uh, can't, you, you show that you um, release the tissue under the coracoid and you mm -hmm. see that you can pull it out to the lesser tuberosity. Is there ever a situation where you can't get it to the footprint where you want it? Um, if you can't get it to the anatomic position, you can always place it a little more medial. Um, we do the same thing with the supraspinatus. Uh, if I don't think I can repair it, hopefully I've had that conversation yesterday in the clinic. I had the same conversation with a patient. You know, seven years ago, I had a subscap tear, which uh, another surgeon elected not to repair. Uh, if he does elect to go to surgery, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to repair it. So we can do, there are other options, but at the very least, I'll address the posterior superior cuff and the biceps. It's not ideal. Um, but uh, those are the circumstances. So the other are some that I can't repair and rarely I'm there and I can't repair it. So I address those uh, structures that I can, uh, but it, uh, it's not been common. My last question actually relates to um, the imaging, the preoperative imaging. And, and this sure. is not a reflection on uh, the radiologists who read your studies, but um, based on the literature, um, you know, and I assume much of the audience knows that musculoskeletal radiologists are not as accurate um, uh, at identifying um, uh, subscapularis tears as we are um, at diagnosing tears of the posterior superior cuff. So, I mean, there's a literature and it, 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 uh, the numbers vary you know, enormously uh, about what our sensitivity and specificity is, but but in your just day-to-day uh, -day experience, do you find that um, these subscapularis tears are identified less frequently um, than than the posterior superior cuff tears, or is it getting better? Uh, it's getting better, but yesterday in the clinic, I had a patient who had clinically a complete subscapularis tear. He, he was unable to do the exam and the uh, imaging report was a high grade partial tear. I can't say that it, to me, it looked like a full thickness tear on MRI, but I'm looking for different things, um, but it's definitely getting better. But all my, I don't look at reports. I look at the MRI images and all my patients bring them in. Um, and I won't take them to surgery without me actually seeing the films so that I can understand and appreciate the, uh, the tear better. Um, I do see some uh, questions in the chat, which yeah. I can uh, refer to. I do use, uh, different portals. The two angles I view from posterior and I view from lateral. I do all of my subscapularis repair in the glenohumeral joint. There are people who do it in the subacromial space. I don't find that to be as helpful, but that's uh, easily done by other surgeons. So you don't necessarily need to do it in the technique uh, that I show. This is just one uh, technique. So I do look at it from different angles because I want to see how the tendon's coming, but mostly from posterior and from lateral. And then the decision between tenotomy and tenodesis, that's a, that's a whole nother 15, 20 minute talk, uh, but it depends upon how much the patient cares and I care. Um, 
the older the patient, patient in the 70s, who uh, um, I can do a tenotomy, uh, I would try to suggest that to them because clinically it's not that much of a difference. There is a deformity. Um, someone who's 50 or younger, I'll uh, suggest a tenodesis. Uh, I'm able to do uh, tenodesis in about four different ways. So it depends upon how I see uh, the tendon. Um, but that is a discussion that I've had uh, preoperatively with the patient because I know in half of my patients, I'm going to see something with the biceps. In my subscaps, it's going to be almost all of them, uh, something with the uh, biceps. So those are the discussions that we have uh, before surgery. Um, uh, if the tenodesis is not going to take away from the rest of my repair, because the shoulder does swell and you have uh, you know, only so much time, uh, then I'll incorporate that into the repair at times. I hope that answered uh, your question. Okay, looks like no one else's hands uh, are raised, so, and nothing in the chat box. Last call for questions. So I, I just wanna thank uh, you all for coming. I wanna thank for the opportunity. This will obviously be available um, for others to view. And uh, I think you're doing a wonderful thing to have this uh, cross fertilization uh, between specialties. Um, we certainly can learn a lot uh, from what you see and what you think is important um, as uh, you've given me this opportunity to share with you today. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, prepare this and, and uh, translate your images so we could understand what you're looking at and see through your eyes. Thank you. All right, and Baring, thank you very much for uh, moderating and uh, uh, managing.